and I'm going to welcome everybody to our um, Amherst community chat for Thursday, February 25th. Um, today, we are excited to have um, Library Director Sharon Shari, or some of you might know her as Sharon Sherry, um, <clears throat> the Director of Libraries. We have um, Trustee Alex Lefebvre on board as well, and the Capital Campaign Chair, Kent Ferber, all on board to discuss the Jones Library Building Project today. Um, as usual, myself, Brianna Sunred here, and um, your other host, Town Manager Paul Bachelman. Before we ask our special guests to introduce themselves and get started into the conversation on the, the library project, I will invite Town Manager Paul Bachelman to give any general updates that he has. Sure, thanks, Brianna. Yeah, so the um, good news, for, uh, exciting news for us is that we've been designated along with the city of Northampton as a regional vaccination site. That means that we will have doses of, of the vaccine coming to the town along with the city of Northampton. We will be running our vaccine clinics out of the Bangs Community Center. Um, the, we don't know how many doses we're going to get. We have, we're hoping to get um, about, um, you know, between the two of us, about 5,000 a week. But how many the, the state actually sends to us is, a, is another question. Um, the... Um, challenge for this is going to be that uh, we bec when we become a regional site, it means it's open to the entire state. That's the deal we made. And so people from anywhere can sign up at the exact same time. So it's not reserved for members of the community. Previously, we were charged with serving Eastern Hampshire County. Uh, this will be a statewide site and that will, you know, there's intense competition for vaccine right now because they just mm -hmm. opened it up to everybody 65 plus and that's um, many, that's a million million people, some a large number like that. And we're getting like 125,000 doses of the vaccine a week. So clearly not enough, a shortage of supply. Um, we will open our website um, for registration on Monday at 11 a.m. Um, we hope to know by Sunday night how many doses we're getting so that we are a, only scheduling uh, people who, the, the number of slots that we have doses for. We don't wanna open up slots and then have tell people, oh, the doses didn't come in. So that's that's really our big news. I mean, the other thing is the um, numbers at UMass are they've changed their operating posture. Uh, they've gone down a little bit. Um, you know, the warm weather is bringing a lot of people outside, which is kind of exciting. But um, you know, COVID is still with us, and we're fighting back. Great, thanks for that update, Paul. So I just want to, um, before I invite the, our special guests to introduce themselves, I just want to remind those who are joining us live to please feel free to use the Q&A function or to raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask your question um, throughout today's session. So without further ado, I'm gonna go and invite our special guests to introduce. I'll start with who's in my top left and that is Kent Ferber. Thank you very much, Brianna. <clears throat> I'm Kent Ferber, and I've been a resident of Amherst for 45 years, and I was a trustee of the library at one point in the 90s, but lately I joined the feasibility committee that helped design this project and then have been working hard to uh, educate the town about, uh, about it and then to raise the money that's the, uh, the separate fundraising component of the project. Excellent, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to Alex. <clears> Hi, <throat> hey, thanks. Um, I'm Alex Lefebvre, I'm a trustee. I'm also on the uh, Buildings and Facilities Committee, Sustainability Committee and Design and Feasibility Committees around the project. Um, my family moved to Amherst in 2001 when my son was 18 months old. He is a cracker kid, an arms kid, an ARHS kid and and now a at home quarantined kid, but um, we've been in the area for a long time. Um, and I became a library trustee, um, I don't even know how long it's been now, like five or six years, sure, and you might do better than me. Um, mostly because for me, um, social justice um, is a really big issue for me. And I was doing a lot of work in the elementary schools and at the survival center and as a language partner at the library. And when there was an opening on the board of trustees, it seemed like a really good synergy of, of, of a place that all of these communities that are important to me come together. And so that's the work that I do is always from that lens. 
Great. Thank you, Alex. And thanks for being here today. And so last but not least, Sharon, if you could introduce yourself to those, there's probably not many who don't know you, but um, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Oh, you're old. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Sharon Sherry. I'm the director of the Jones Library. Uh, I've been directing the Jones for nine and a half years now. Um, and uh, Born and raised in Western Mass, went to uh, my undergraduate is at is from is in Poli Sci from UMass Amherst, and I've been directing, gosh, public libraries for almost thirty years now, um, and it's an honor to be with you all. Great, thank you. So we have um, some questions that have already been submitted, but I also want to invite um, again remind people in the room. I just saw an couple new people enter, raise your hand via Zoom, star nine from a phone or the Q&A function directly. Um, you can pop your questions in there and I'll read them to our group. So the first question that might be a great uh, stage setter for the rest of the conversation is what is the status of the library project now? Um, what are some of the next steps and kind of what's the timeline looking like for this project? I'm gonna let Kent answer that question. <laughs> um. The uh, Mass Board of Library Commissioners has uh, awarded a grant to the library to help pay for a significant part of this. And that has been waiting for its funding, uh, but it now looks like we're online for this spring. And so the trustees, after working on this project for 10 years, have asked the council to commit to deciding whether it wants to go forward with this project by providing the town's portion of the financing for it. And the trustees have asked the town to make that decision in April. So uh, last Monday, the library made a major presentation for an hour, which you can watch on Vimeo. Uh, that has almost everything you'd wanna know about the project. And there are two public forums scheduled for the next Wednesday at 6.30, and then next Saturday the 6th at 2. And there are obviously lots of opportunities for people to write and ask questions, make their voices known to the council, a good many people have, but those will be the next steps. If the council turns the project down, the library will have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what options they have uh, presumably with some direction from the council about how much they have to spend. Uh, a, a, a couple of repair options, so-called, have been developed, but they're not nearly as polished or finished as the proposal for the project, and they would definitely need a lot of work before going forward. If the town approves the project, then the MBLC will, uh, as soon as a contract is signed with it, the state will provide the first 20% of the 13.8 million they've awarded, which will allow the library to begin in earnest the drafting of construction documents, uh, finally settling on a design for it. What we have to date is just uh, what's called schematics and they need to be finalized. So that a bid can be, uh, a request for bids can be put out and then a contract award. Uh, that will take probably a year or so and then construction. In the meantime, then if the project goes forward, uh, the library has to, be, has to begin getting ready to move out for the time that construction will take place. And there's a lot of work thereafter. In the meantime, also there is a fundraising component of the financing of this. And once we know we have a project for sure, which we haven't had until this point, and which in fact has impeded our fundraising rather substantially, there's a number of professional granting sources, foundations and banks and historic tax credits and the state uh, cultural facilities fund that are just not gonna accept an application when there's so much uncertainty about whether there's gonna be a project. So once that happens and uncertainty is removed, we will go into high fundraising gear. And um, I can talk about that a little bit more later. Great. Thanks for, for setting the stage for us. We've got a couple of questions in from the room that um, I'm going to ask now to our guests. And feel free, whoever's the best um, of you to speak to. The first is, what is the square footage of the latest design? And what was cut from the initial design submitted to the MBLC in 2016? And MBLC, for 
Um, acronym busting sake is the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Yeah, so right now, I, I actually do have that figure in front of me. Right now, the designs are at 61,296 square feet. Um, and uh, basically what has happened was um, it, it got, it has been shrinking. Uh, the architects have been working on that due to concerns for, you know, a smaller footprint. Um, but, but also as we get, into design development, further efficiencies will be happening. So, um, so that square footage is kind of like a moving target, if if that makes sense. So, nothing specific has been cut. Uh, it, it's more about the architects doing what they do and um, and gaining those efficiencies. And I can I can add on to that as well. So, part of that. Um, was um, because the sustainability committee gave direction to the architects to make the most efficient uh, library possible. Um, certain things relative to heating, cooling, and so there are spaces that actually could be condensed because once we know how, by paying the architects more money and telling them what we wanted out of building efficiency, mm -hmm. it gave them more clarity about what the systems would look like, which then allowed them to shrink certain spaces because instead of having an unknown space for heating, cooling, et cetera, you now know what you need. So nothing's been cut out of the program um, from the MBLC. It's just fine tuning and working toward efficiencies um, that we've been able to gain through the, the through giving the architects more information. Yes, let, I'm sorry, if I'm, no, I'm not muted. Let me uh, emphasize that the program, we were, uh, since the application, the library has definitely uh, indicated to the to the MBLC that it it will fulfill the program the, what the activities that the library wants needs to conduct in there will be maintained those have not been cut it's just been able to, I mean translating that into a building is um, is a moving target. All right, great, thank you. So a couple more questions came rolling in. Um, how much of the community campaign fundraising is in hand at this point, um, not counting pledges or spent funds? Uh, well, the answer to that is pretty simple, not very much, um, because nobody is, we don't want people to give us cash that we would have to return if the project were turned down. So we have received a bequest of $273,000 that uh, of which about 120 has been spent, but it's been spent almost all with a very little exception on either uh, the expenses of a campaign that are built into the budget or the expenses of the project. For example, the cost of coming up with the sustainability uh, changes had to be paid for and those came out of that bequest. Uh, but other than that, um, the rest of it is pledges. Great. Anything, anything you guys wanted to add, Alex or Sharon? Just, just to be clear, the amount of those pledges are now a million fifty thousand dollars. I mean, it's a, people are saying, okay, if you go forward with this progress, we are behind you. And in fact, the number is thirty-six thousand more than we reported to the town council last Monday. Speaking of the the presentation that was made on Monday, this next question references. Um, a figure or a statement that that was made during mm -hmm. that. So <clears throat> how many of the, I'll make sure I get this number right, 227,000 visitors mentioned during the presentation were to the Jones Library building in person. How many went beyond the front desk? Um, and this person says a quick calculation gives mm -hmm. over 60 people for 10 hours a day for three, 365 days a year. Uh, so I, 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 yeah, so I did. I didn't get all the added calculations, but the two twenty-seven figure is the number of people that come into the Jones Building. Uh, there's even more people that go into the, you know, the branch. The branch attendance is is not included in that two hundred and twenty-seven thousand figure. Uh, but once people come into the building, we're not tracking them. I, I, we don't. You know, we have no way of knowing where they are in the building. Great, thank and you for clarifying. And I would add to that figure, and I don't have it off the top of my head, but I mean, you know, 
our meeting rooms, when we're open, our meeting rooms are booked year round. Our um, attendance in our programs are fully booked year round. So I think you definitely have people who come in to use the computers because they don't have computer access or internet at home. But then you also have people who are coming to attend a meeting. You've got language learners who are coming in to attend tutoring. You've got, so, I mean, it's, yeah, we just know the numbers that walk through our door and use our programming services and facilities. But um, unless they're attending a specific program where we're tracking, I mean, I guess the closest thing you could look at would be our circulation as well, which is another number, which we are the, what number are we in terms of circulation, Sharon? Uh, let's say 450 just at the Jones. No, I mean, in terms I mean, in terms of uh, how much we circulate compared to other libraries. We are the 20th busiest public library in the state of Massachusetts. It's a, it's a really important, it, it, that's an important statistic to really understand because when you first walk into the Jones Library, you just, you just see this really sweet home, right? And, and you think, well, you know, you're, you're walking by your neighbors and okay, so this is Amherst. This is our cozy little Amherst, but but when you look at library services across the entire state of Massachusetts, we, we are right up there. 20 out of 352, you know, 53 different public libraries throughout the state. That's an, impre an impressive statistic. And to piggyback on, sorry, Kent, to piggyback on what Alex was just saying. Um, uh, so, so all of our programs that are going on virtually, uh, you know, that's a separate figure. Um, but also... Where else was I going with this? Um, lost, lost my train of thought. Go for it, Ken. Well, we, we should be clear that the usage of the library while it's closed is completely different from when it's open. And when it's open, the library is required by the state to accumulate the most incredible collection of data about usage that you can imagine. I can tell you, for example, that our computers are used 29,000 times in a year. Our meeting rooms are used a thousand times a year. 16,000 hours of ESL uh, tutoring and meetings uh, uh, go on during the year. Uh, I mean, it's just an incredible number that's all publicly available on the MBLC's website. I'm not making it up and they keep track of this every year. So for all you data lovers out there, check out their website and check out Joe and Stats. A lot of that information was new for me. So that was really interesting as a as a patron of the library. That's really, really cool. I did not realize that. So I have a question next and maybe this is something Paul's gonna chime in on, but this is about where does the town contribution to this financing fit in the overall picture, um, especially when taken in consideration with the three other major um, capital building projects that we're facing. Yeah, so I'll take the first crack at it. And so, yeah, so we have four major capital uh, projects, uh, DPW, library, schools, and fire. And one of the challenges since I started here was how do we get all these things um, happening at the same time? Uh, this week or last week, we presented a plan that mainly developed by our finance director, Sean Mangano, that shows how we can do all four projects within a budget um, and with one debt exclusion. So that means we will be doing these things without tax increases uh, other than the normal tax increases, except for the school, the school, which uh, we can't do any of the other three buildings if we don't do a debt exclusion for the school. And the town has already approved previously on the previous school project approved a debt mm -hmm. exclusion for that. So we sense that there is a acceptability of that debt, debt exclusion for the school. So this plan shows uh, this project able to move forward with the contribution from the town with a significant um, fundraising effort by the by the library trustees, which Kent is leading up and has already shown some so significant success there um, with a, a big grant from the Board of Library Trustees. It's dependent on a large grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So taking advantage of those two grants, uh, the debt exclusion mm -hmm. and the um, making room in our capital budget in our budget, in our operating budget to make sure that we can fund the debt service on all four of these projects. And the last piece of it is for years, we have been build, building up our reserves. We've been very disciplined about our spending. Sharon can tell you how many times she's come in to ask her for more funds. And we're saying we, we've been very disciplined about our um, what we're approving. 
um, because we were trying to purposely build up our savings account. And that savings account will be used to shave off the peaks so that we don't have to do additional debt exclusions. It's a strong plan. It's a it's a conservative plan. Um, it's it doesn't take risk because it's something that we feel like we can continue to um, service all of our operating budgets, and we reserve funds for our normal capital budgets too: vehicles, the normal things that we buy, ambulances, all that stuff that we normally buy in the course of our operations. So, I think it's something we're doing workshops uh, right now. Sean Magano did one last night. He's going to do another one on March sixth, where we have a tool that people can participate in and they can put in different numbers and say, well, what if we did it this way or that way? And it lets you see the sort of um, calculations about it. So I, th I think we're, I think we're on a good, we have a good path forward. And that tool that Paul mentioned is online on our website, on our capital planning page. You can access it there. Also um, from our Engage Amherst Dot org. We have a, a project page dedicated to finance the financial elements of these projects. The tool is also linked there. Uh, we do have a question that Kate just came in. Was a second independent cost estimate obtained? And where would one find the detail of the 2020 updated estimate from Fennessy? Yeah, oh, that, that's a great question. Uh, so both cost estimates are on the Jones Library's website. Um, if you can find the building project page, you will see the 2016 cost estimate and you'll see the 2020 cost estimate. And can I, can I add to that also? Um, so I think it's, there's two important things to understand about a cost estimate. So the cost estimate is a construction cost estimate, but the actual project cost estimate is something that's generated by the owner project manager, which is Collier's. So the total cost of the project, which was in the MBLC grant, and then the total updated cost um, that we have now that we presented to town when they asked for information are created from the owner's project manual, man, bleh, can't speak, owner's project manager. So there is a fantasy for cost for both, but to have the totality, you have to understand that's an OPM generated number, not simply a cost of construction number. And could I also add that <clears throat> both of those, if you, uh, 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 if you look at those, those, both of those estimates and then you put it in the context of the larger estimate that was sent to the MBLC, you will find contingencies in both. So people who are worried about cost overrun uh, can relax quite a bit because there's generous contingencies in there. Great, thank you. We've got a couple more questions here. Um, one is, when is the town council going to um, meet to vote on this project? Is there a set date or an anticipated date? Maybe Paul has that one. Yeah, so the goal of the council is to vote in April. Um, so that's not that far away. You know, six, you know, four to six weeks away. Um, that's why there's a lot of um, time to, for the trustees and the council. Quite, uh, these are council-sponsored listening sessions and discussion sessions that are, they've scheduled for March 3rd and March 6th. Um, people always want to know the broader context, which is how are we doing it? I'm interested in this, but I want to know how it fits in with my overall budget. So that's why we did the four capital thing. So people have all the information they need to weigh in. And what they should do is communicate to their counselors. They, the council is the group that has to actually cast a vote. And uh, that's where the decision will made in there. They've teed this up for April. And if you're not sure who your counselor is, your district is, you can you can go um, to amherstma.gov slash town council. All the direct emails to all of the counselors are there um, should you want to reach out to your respective counselor. Um, I just wanna give a, another, we've got a five, we're coming up on our half hour. I know it goes really quick. That's um, <laughs> I wanna give a last call to live um, attendees in the room. Feel free to pop your questions into Q&A or raise your hand. I do have another question here um, that relates to the town council's vote. Um, if the town does not approve the project, what are the what are what are the options and what will they cost? Um, so can we speak to a little bit of that scenario? You know, so so Ken, I'm sorry, Paul. Um, uh, I'll start and then you can take mm -hmm. it. So you know, just like with any. Um, any capital project that the library has or any town department, um, we, the trustees would uh, go back and say, okay, what are our, our biggest needs? And um, we would attend a lot of meetings and, and, 
and we would end up going through the JCPC process. So that's that would be our next step if town council votes it down. Paul, do you have more yeah, to no, add? It's, it's, it's an up or down vote. If the town if the town council authorizes uh, us to borrow the money, we will do that. If they say no, we don't want to borrow the money, then this project, as conceived, does not move forward. It's just pretty but, simple. But but we should be clear that we have some idea that the alternatives aren't that great. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we got a very specific and you can, it's another 15 page estimate, you can find it online that will cost 14 to $16 million just to repair the HVAC system, the elevator, the skylight and some tuck pointing and, and interior painting. And that's about the amount that um, is called for, for uh, by the participation of the town in this project. So the alternatives aren't particularly good and they have to be faced up to. There's no way that everybody agrees that this building is unsatisfactory. It is I, not, it, rep it, I mean, you know, it doesn't represent the town of Amherst, it's not usable. And <clears throat> to, to just to do uh, basic repairs, we now have a pretty good quote is about 14 to $16 million. And that's a good point because all of our buildings mm -hmm. are in that same boat. You know, the same with the, DP, the DPW roof is falling in. If we're going to have to put a new roof on it, the you know, fire station is inadequate. Um, the schools are in the same boat. So if we don't borrow the money to move forward on these projects, we're going to be spending money on other things on those existing buildings. And, and we should understand that this is, this is totally predictable because we've gone 30 years without addressing these particular needs. I mean, the last, as far as I know, the last major capital construction project was the police station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have a couple more questions that rolled in. So I'm gonna to try to get these um, asked before our time is up. This is a follow-up to a previously asked question. Um, so with, what firm performed the second independent construction cost estimate other than Fennessy and where would one find that document? Do you want me, do you want me to take that one, Sharon? Sure, sure. Okay. So, Maybe there's a little confusion. So um, as part of the MBLC grant process, the OPM generated a project budget. Um, there was a cost construction, there was a construction cost estimate done by Fennessy. When the sustainability committee went back and said, and paid FAA additional funds to then take the existing plan that we had and to make it a more sustainable design, then the architects redid their plan and then again worked with Fennessy to go back and look at the construction costs based on the newer sustainable design. So there's no, there's no other, so you've got Western builders who did the repair estimate that Kuhn Riddle then reevaluated, brought up to 2020 with accessibility and brought it up to current construction costs. And then you have Fennessy and Feingold Alexander which are the renovation and expansion projects. So those are gonna be the only construction estimates are gonna be Western Builders and Fennessy. And then total project costs are coming from June Riddle for the repair and from the OPM for the renovation and expansion. And as Sharon said, they're, they're all on the website. And, and if that, the person who asked that question, if they have more follow-ups, um, I'm sure that you could email in and we could get more details connected to that. Um, another question here is what happens if the town does not approve an override for the schools? That might be a, a Paul. So, so what an override for the schools means is that the, the money for that debt that we borrow is done, is put on the tax bill over and above what your normal tax bill is. Um, and if the, if the voters say, we don't want to take on that added tax burden, then that has to be folded within the existing budget of the town. And so the council would take that into consideration as to whether they should move forward with the school or not, whether that we can carve out the, that pretty significant kind of borrowing um, in, a, in our existing budget. Great, thank you. I think we need to do a schoolhouse rock episode on, on um, <laughs> debt exclusion overrides all, coming up in all these chats. Um, all right, so we are at the end of our time. I do want to give a moment or two for our special guests to leave the attendees and um, later viewers with any calls to action, anything that you want people to do or be aware of in the coming weeks. 
You know, one of the things that Kent has said, uh, it, it, it has to do with, with with the amount of money that, that the Capital Campaign Committee and the trustees uh, ha- have brought in. So we have this $14 million grant. Um, we have this $1 million CPA grant. We have over a million dollars in pledges. Uh, and, and so that's a substantial amount of money um, that would be turned away if, if this project is... Um, squashed. So I, I kind of want people to think about the magnitude of that. Excellent. Thank you, Sharon. Alex or Kent, anything that you want to? I, I would just encourage people. I, there is, this process has been going on for 10 years. Um, I came into the process as a trustee sort of halfway through and I'm very familiar with how much there is to catch up with. Um, but the presentation that we gave to town council that was presented by the person who does the historic tax credits, the architects who came up with the design. The, so all of the people who did the individual parts of these pieces, there's a nice one hour presentation. And I think if somebody has an hour and really wants to understand the project, um, I think it's, a, it's an hour um, really well spent to look at that presentation. Well done. Excellent, okay. And I, I, I just wanna say following what after Alex said, I believe if it's not up yet, that recording from Monday's meeting, it should be up there very soon. So um, you'd be able to catch that on our YouTube channel. All, All right. right. Can I just okay. add that the website, the, the, the project section of the Jones Library website is a Niagara Falls of information. <laughs> Recordings of the chats we've had. All of the, anything you want to know about this project is there. Mm-hmm. Some weekend uh, activities for everybody who really wants to dive in. (laughs) All right, well, we are um, up on our time. Again, if there were questions or follow-ups, please feel free to, um, you can easily email them to info at amherstma.gov and I can get them into the right hands of um, who who would be able to answer that. This will be up on our YouTube channel in case you want to share with friends or refer back to it. Um, So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you again to our special guests for taking some time today. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.